Governor, great to see you. Good to be back. Uh, how's it going? How are you feeling about running for president? I feel great. You know, I've been in it for five weeks. Um, I feel really good. I feel like, you know, what I'm saying to people is starting to break through in terms of what we're seeing in the polling. You know, we're at 9% now in New Hampshire, only four points behind Governor DeSantis. And uh, for five weeks, that's pretty good. So we're feeling good about the way it's going. And I will tell you that um, I'm enjoying myself, and I think it comes through. The big elephant in the room is not here, um, Donald Trump way ahead in the polls at the moment for the Republican nomination. How are you going to knock him out? Directly. There's no way to do this like playing bumper pool, Pierce. And I think that's the biggest uh, mistake that my adversaries in this race are making. They think somehow if they, you know, maybe kind of in a sideways looking way, they say something negative about Trump that people will get it and then they'll go to them. Look, there's one lane to the Republican nomination, in my opinion, and Donald Trump's at the head of that lane. And if you want to be the man, you got to beat the man and you got to go right through him. And how do you, do, how do, you do that whilst not alienating the not insignificant number of people in his MAGA base who blindly support Trump, who don't even care he's been indicted on criminal charges? They believe it's all a stitch up because he's told them that. How do you manage to knock him out and wipe him out of the race and keep those people coming with you, which you need to win a general election? Well, look, first off, I think that the group that you'd have to be worried about alienating is relatively small compared to the entire Republican primary. And then in the general election, if you do knock him out, look, those folks are going to look at the choice between me and Joe Biden. And even if they feel some resentment towards me from knocking out Donald Trump, they don't want 82-year-old Joe Biden, let alone 86-year-old Joe Biden, in the White House. So, and, and I think when they listen to me about the issues, Pierce, you know, I want to send the National Guard to the border to interdict fentanyl. I'll actually build the wall as opposed to the 47 miles that Donald Trump built in four years. That's 12 miles a year. He needs like 40 years as president <laughs> to be able to finish the entire wall. Um, he said he was going to repeal and replace Obamacare. Didn't get it done. Said he was going to balance the budget. He added $6 trillion to the debt. So Republican primary voters deserve two things. The truth, which they're not getting from Joe Biden or Donald Trump and results on issues they care about. Donald Trump had a chance to do that as president. He didn't. Why should we give him another? You, in your previous life, were a lawyer. You were a, a prosecutor, federal prosecutor. I think you had 130 cases that you waged against all sorts of people, from the mafia to the Bloods and Crips gangs to uh, Jared Kushner's dad, yes. uh, who actually went to prison as a result of one of your prosecutions. You never lost a case. I remember you telling me this years ago when I interviewed you at CNN very proudly. I think I said to you, how many, how many did you win? And you said, ask me a different question. Ask me how many I lost. Right. Because the answer was a big fat zero. That's an impressive record. Your record politically is not as unblemished. No. Do you think you can win this? Or could it go down as a, as a big L at the end of the day? Well, everyone's going to lose except for one person at the end. So, you know, you run that risk when you run. But I absolutely believe I can win this race. And the reason is because I think the, the American people are tired of politicians who talk but don't deliver results. And in the end, what you can say lots of different things about my tenure in New Jersey. And it certainly wasn't unblemished, mm. but it was consequential. We saved $150 billion reforming the pensions for public workers with a Democratic legislature. No one thought that could ever get done. We fired the entire Camden City Police Department because they were ineffective. And in the last 10 years since we brought that new police department in, murders down 75%. What do you most regret about your tenure as governor? Gosh, I mean, the George Washington Bridge stuff. I mean, that's easy answer. Um, you know, three people who went off on a toot on their own um, and did something that was incredibly childish and juvenile. I fired them because of it. And, but it, it probably caused a year, year and a half of tumult in our state that was unnecessary. And in the end, I'm accountable for that because I hired those people. Um, I didn't know about what went on, but when I found out, I fired them. And regardless of whether I knew or not, I'm accountable. You've always struck me as a, a straight shooter. You're a pugilist by nature. Mm -hmm. Someone punches you, you punch him back. Yep. Trump's like that. You know that. Yep. Um, you were with him for a long time. I was. What was the tipping point for you? to turn on Trump. Election night 2020, Pierce, because when he stood up at 2.30 in the morning behind the seal of the president in the East Room of the White House and told the American people that the election had been stolen, when he had no evidence to prove that it was, 
to me, that's undercutting our democracy and people's belief in it. And that is beneath the office that the people blessed him with. And I think that, you know, no one likes to lose. I've won and I've lost. Winning's better. Mm. And it makes you feel better. But when you get in this game, you know that you can lose. And you got to be a man about it, stand up, and take your loss like a man, and put the country first. So that was the night, and I said it on ABC that night, that I couldn't support what he was doing, and I couldn't support him if he was going to continue to And when you saw it. the aftershock of that on January the 6th with the riots at the Capitol as a direct consequence of his refusal to accept of defeat, course. What, what did you feel when you watched that? Sick to my stomach. And, and quite frankly, astonished that that could happen in our country. I expected that to see that in some other country with a less developed democracy. Some people have sort of tried to play it down. But I remember watching that and thinking, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that in the United States. I've never seen anything like it in the United where States. Where the actual embodiment, the physical embodiment of freedom and democracy was under attack by Americans, whipped into a frenzy by a president who simply could not accept that he'd lost an, a, a fair democratic election. I mean, he keeps talking about it being stolen, but he, as I keep saying to him, where's the evidence Man. it was stolen? There isn't any evidence. There isn't any. And look, you could talk a lot of things about, about Donald Trump in terms of how he lies. But let's just look at January 6th. He stood in the ellipse that day, fired those people up, mm. and said, let's march to the Capitol in our march with you. Where the hell was he? He sent those people on a mission to destroy the Capitol. Do you think he meant for them to commit acts of violence? I don't think he cared. Right, which is as bad. Yeah, I don't think he cared. I think what he wanted to do was play as close to the edge of the envelope as he could he wanted to intimidate Mike Pence. He wanted to intimidate the Congress and try to buy any delay he could to try to stay in office. You know, he told me one time the White House was the most luxurious place he'd ever lived in in his life, and he didn't want to leave. Well, you know what? If I go to the White House, I'm not going to care how luxurious it is. I'm going to be honored that I'm in the same place where John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln sat, and we're going to try to do big things for this country. He doesn't care about that. He just wants to do big things for himself. You've, you've been a prosecutor. When you see the evidence, obviously we've had the Stormy Daniels case, all right, that may be relatively small potatoes by comparison to some of the others, but it was an indictment. We've then had the, the documents issue at Mar-a-Lago, which seems altogether much more serious. Uh, then we've got what maybe more indictments coming on what happened with the Georgia phone call. Uh, and there may be more to follow after that as well, uh, around January the 6th. He could end up with four different sets of indictments on criminal charges and yet still be able to run as president and, in fact, still be able to win as president. And potentially, if he gets put into a prison cell, which is almost unthinkable, but it could technically happen, he could still be president from his prison cell. Is that right, that that can happen in your country? No, it's not right for it to happen in our country. But I'll tell you, our founders never thought that anybody would be such an egomaniac mm. that when charged with crimes, they would still run. You know, I remember everything that the, that the media and a lot of people in America said when I was a young man about Richard Nixon. But when Richard Nixon was confronted with the reality that he was going to put the country through an impeachment trial, he put the country first and he resigned. Even though Nixon didn't think he should have resigned, but he did it for the good of the country. Can anyone imagine Donald Trump even doing that for the good of the country? And that's the problem. I love the people who say, I know he's not a great guy, but I like his policies. Well, the question is, if you like his policies, why would you ever hire him to get those policies implemented. They would say back at you, all right, but you were with him for a long time, knowing exactly what he's like. I mean, I've known Trump a long time. He hasn't really changed his character. He's gotten he's, worse. He's always told whoppers over the years, right? I don't think he's been the king of veracity for no. decades, right? So to suddenly wake up and go, all right, he's a terrible liar. I can't be with him anymore. How do you defend yourself against the charge? Well, you should have stood up against him much earlier. Sure, because, it, you know, this, this reminds me of a story about one of your former prime ministers. Prime Minister Cameron, I went over to visit in 2015, and he was getting ready to run for re-election. And he was telling me it's only 48 days, the election season in, in Great Britain. He said, how the hell do you guys do this for as long as you do it? And explain your system to me. And I said, well, David, I said, the easiest way to describe it is, in America, you don't necessarily get to vote for who you want to vote for. You get to vote for who's left. And in 2016, I ran against Donald Trump. Mm. I lost. Who was left was Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. 
I did not want Hillary Clinton to be president. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, as we sit here right now, Piers, I have no regrets of helping Donald Trump get elected in 2016 because I think Hillary Clinton would have been a monumentally worse president than Donald Trump. If he's the nominee Trump. this time round and beats you again to, to be nominee, would you vote for him? Yeah, I've answered this one before. No. You wouldn't? No. What's the difference between the last time? Undercutting and of the democracy. As I said, when you show you don't have respect. So even if you're, you would be more prepared for Biden to win again in that scenario. I, I, I hope that neither one of them is the nominee. But I couldn't vote. But if they are the two nominees, well, then the option is that Biden, you then, would help Biden I, win. No, no, I go on vacation. Yeah, but by not voting, you would potentially help him win. Well, I could be. Uh, How would you feel if Biden won by one vote and it turned out to be you, Chris Christie? <laughs> Guess what? In our electoral college system, one vote in New Jersey <laughs> will not make the difference. So good try, please. <laughs> For those who don't know you, what are the best and worst things about your personality? If you're going to be president, what, what would you I think say? The, I think the, the best things about my personality is that I'm honest, I'm direct, and I care. Um, I really have a soft, empathetic heart um, that displays itself in a lot of different ways with me as a father and, mm. and also with me as somebody who cares deeply about the drug crisis in our country and wanting to give people a second chance and give them the tools they need to recover from the disease of addiction. Um, and I care about that. I've lost friends um, in that way, one very dear friend. And, you know, I know how bad that is. Now, look. When you're direct and you're honest and you're blunt, sometimes you say things that you should have stayed in your mouth. Mm. Um, and, and I've done that at times over my career. And sometimes I'm too quick to judge. And you need Are to... You, do you have a temper like President Biden, it turns out, has a ferocious foul mouth temper uh, behind the scenes? Uh, uh, not as bad as him as it sounds from what I've read lately, but I can lose my temper. Look... I'm a, I'm a Sicilian American from New Jersey, so every once in a while we'll let off with a few good ones um, here and there, but never really to the people, um, you know, in a way that makes people not want to work for me. In fact, I'm really proud of the fact that the group that's working on this campaign for me are the same people that worked for me in 2009 when I ran for governor the first time, and we've been together now for 14 years. And I think, you know, that's the difference between me and Donald Trump in the end. All my people have been with me for 14 years and haven't left me. Donald Trump, if you look at it, not one of his White House chiefs of staff would come back and work for him. Not one of his secretaries of state, his secretaries of defense, his attorneys general, his, his secretary of the treasury. These people would not come back and work for him. And, and that tells you something, doesn't it? If he were president again, none of those people would come back and work for him because working for him was so awful. And you what, would it, what would it say about America if Trump wins again? Look, I think the rest of the world will look at us and think, why would you want someone of that awful character and that mediocre performance to be your president? And I think the rest of the world would question our votes. But let's face it, Piers, there have been a lot of times we look at other countries, too, and we question the people that they've elected. I mean, how many prime ministers have you guys had in the last, like, oh my God, three don't, years? Don't I even mean, get me on my, <laughs> my country. Right? So, so we all have questions about that. But in the end, America's role is a little bit different. And we are the leader of democracy around the world. We are the arsenal of democracy. We are the shining light to people who look for us to be able to stand strong and defend liberty in the world. And we need somebody different than Donald Trump or Joe Biden to do that. It's very interesting you raise that because I've been really struck by the fact the Republican Party, in fact, of all the candidates, very split over this issue of Ukraine and how involved America should be. Some of the candidates implacably opposed to any more involvement, in fact, want to remove any more money and, and military hardware and so on. Many others completely full on behind Ukraine and supporting President Biden and giving them what they need. Where do you sit with this? I sit fully behind Ukraine. Look, for a few reasons. One, um, you know, we talked about the fact that Governor DeSantis interviewed with you um, and, and, you know, he had said that to Tucker Carlson that it was a territorial dispute. Let me tell you what a territorial dispute is. When they survey your property at home and your fence is eight inches over on your, on your neighbor's <laughs> property, that's a territorial dispute. Not rolling tanks and artillery into a, a freedom-loving country and killing innocent people and taking their land by force. We have to stand up against those kind of authoritarian aggressors. And remember, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump says he's a terrific guy and a great leader. I don't know. It doesn't look like that to me. I stand behind Ukraine for that reason. Second, it's a proxy war with China. China is funding the Russians in this war. 
They are coordinating with Iran to provide weapons. And watching to weapons. see what happens with regard to potentially invading Taiwan. That's right, where I was going, Piers. You know, the Chinese are going to look at this and say, does America stand up for its friends? Mm. Taiwan's a friend of America. If we're not going to stand up for Ukraine, guess what? President Xi, another guy who Donald Trump thinks is a great guy mm. and handsome, too, um, you know, uh, he, he, he thinks that of Xi. Xi will be in Taiwan um, faster than you could say Jimmy Carter um, if we don't stand up in Ukraine. And so to me, they have deserved our support because of who they are. And we, in our own national interests, have to support Ukraine to send a very clear message to China, Iran, and North Korea. Talking of fighting, if you and Trump got in the ring, he loves his UFC and stuff like that, right? If you got in the octagon, you and him, who'd, who'd win? Come on. Guy's 78 years old. I'd kick his ass. <laughs> I mean, we know that Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg are apparently going to get in Yeah, there. I can't wait for that you one. Want, do you want to be on Did the you un- see that picture of Zuckerberg? Yeah. Looking pretty buff. It does. If I were Elon, I'd be a little bit worried. But, I mean, would you be prepared to be on the undercard? You against Trump? Look, I'll fight Donald Trump anywhere he wants, in any in arena he wants, um, whether it's on a debate stage or in the uh, octagon. He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I mean, for goodness sakes, come on. I mean, look. You know what? Here's the, here's the bottom line, Pierce. I, you know, for the last 30 years, I've struggled with my weight. Like tens of millions of Americans struggle with their weight. And there are times where I do well and there are times when I don't do very well. Um, and it's a struggle. And for him to be such a child, an infant, and make those kind of remarks, especially, I guess, when he's staying up in Bedminster, New Jersey, there are no mirrors where he <laughs> is. Because all he needs to do is look at himself and what he should do first Work on himself. Mm. Then when he gets himself, because, you know, he wears those ties, mm. you know, eight the feet long. The ties, yeah. Yeah, eight feet long because he told me this, because they slenderize him. Mm. Let me tell you, fail. <laughs> not working. Okay? <laughs> but here's the thing. At least I've never pretended to be anything that I'm not. Mm. I, I own my weaknesses. I own my strengths. And I'm transparent about it. and People can see it. Um, and when he says that stuff about me, to me, coming from him, it's a compliment. Do you, do you feel you were born to run? Well, it depends on what kind of running you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> on our last topic. For, for president. <laughs> oh, for president. Um, look, I think that, that for somebody... There's who, a reason I'm asking you that specific question. Well, of course. And I think that your God, God gives you certain skills, talents, and interests. Mm. And what you make of them can lead you to where you go in your life. I was really getting to who sang Born to Run. Oh, you're getting to Mr. Springsteen. Because the other most famous person come out of New Jersey, yeah. Bruce Springsteen. How many times have you seen him in concert? Currently 148. <laughs> when was the last time? The last time was... he's on tour, right? Yeah, he is. The last time was uh, in April at the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. Have you ever met him? Yes, a number of times. Because there was a period when he was quite critical of you well when i endorsed trump he was not quite yes. too happy with me yeah. that, did that sever the relationship it, it cooled it it cooled it are but things it, back on track now you've been hammering trump things are getting better <laughs> things are getting better the new jersey boys are back that's back right. together that's right because now you're saying the right stuff well i'm saying stuff he agrees with and mm. i think it's right um, did you have that conversation privately with him did he try and persuade you to No, stop? no, no, no. He more reacted to some of the stuff I was doing mm. um, and commented to me privately about it. What did he say? I'm not going to tell you. Well, give me a hint. That's between me and the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Harry in 2012, when Hurricane Sandy, I was at CNN when Hurricane Sandy yeah. swept through Manhattan. I remember the building CNN was in swaying. It was yeah. scary stuff. The power going out, the water, it was mayhem. Uh, Prince Harry famously visited uh, your state, he did. your guest at the time, and you did a walkabout with him. We did. Uh, things have sort of moved on for him since then. What do you make of what's gone on with Meghan and Harry and their journey to freedom? Well, I've never met Meghan, so it's hard for me. And I, I try, as someone who is a public figure, to not judge too much based upon what I read or see. So I don't have really any opinions on Meghan. I found Harry, when I met him in 2012, to be a really kind-hearted young man, but also a pretty sad and confused one. And, and I'll give you one example. He, he, um, we were to exchange gifts when he got off the helicopter in New Jersey, and I had a fleece, like the fleece I was wearing um, during Hurricane Sandy. I gave him a fleece that said Prince Harry on it. He didn't give me a gift back. 
And I thought, hmm, all right, well, he <laughs> must have gotten the briefing wrong or whatever. <laughs> we later went back to the governor's beach house to have lunch together after the walkabout. And um, he said, now, look, I have a gift for you. He said, but I didn't want to give it in front of all those people. And I will give it to you now, but only if you promise not to open it until I leave. Mm. And I said, why? And he said, because they make me give this and it makes me very uncomfortable. So I said, fine, Harry. And he goes into his bag and it's this wrapped gift and he puts it on the table. And I honored his request and didn't open it. When we opened it afterwards, it was a framed picture, framed autographed picture of himself. <laughs> Are you and serious? I swear to you. And, and, and now I knew in, in a way why he was sad. Because yeah, nobody would have made him do that. He doesn't have to give people signed pictures of himself. He said, they make me give this. It's ridiculous. And well, I don't know, because again, you look at me, mm. you're not thinking royalty, right? So, but I, I saw I, the other day, he was, he'd got a commercial flight and the steward posted a picture and Harry had given him a signed copy of his book. It's obviously his shtick even now. Well, he goes around giving people signed sign things. Look, I think a signed copy of your <laughs> book is different. This was a framed picture of himself. What did you do with it? I gave it to my daughter, mm. um, who thought he was really cute. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she kept the picture, and she still has it. It's interesting what's happened to them, because uh, the Spotify executive kind of summed up what many people think and called them effing little grifters. Yeah. Um, very unpopular in the UK now, because they basically trashed the royal family so yeah. recklessly. What do you think of that? I think it's awful. You're, you're a big family man. I am. I think it's awful. Mm. I think if you have those kind of disputes with your father, with your brother, other members of your family. That, that's fine, families fight, but they need to fight inside the family. Right. And, and I think when he decided to go public with all of that, and the only conclusion I can draw are two. One, that it was somehow cathartic for him, mm. and he's obviously a troubled young man, and who could wonder about that because of his mother's passing at such a young age. But, but secondly, it had to be to make money. And, and I think that that, to trash your family for cash. I totally agree. Um, I think is, is beneath someone who's been given mm. all the honors he's been given over the course of his life. And so, but the good thing is, I'm hopeful that, you know, his father now has what he's always wanted. Mm. And I'm hoping that King Charles will be um, forgiving. I think he's tried, but I think he's pretty much at the stage of washing his hands of him now because the, the, the attacks just... Well, that's continue. incredibly sad. If that's what it is... I think you can't trust him. Every yeah. time he turns up, he just takes all the material he garners back and puts it in some other publication. And I th if that's what it is, then, then you know, as, even as a father, mm. there are moments where you just have to walk away. But I'll tell you, as a father of four, mm. that it would be really hard for me to walk away from any of my children. Yeah. And if that's where the king is, it's a pretty sad place for him too. Not his fault necessarily at all, but a sad place for him at a moment in his life when he should be really pretty happy. He's got the woman he, he's always loved mm. and he's got the job he always wanted. It's pretty good. About a, over a decade ago, I hung out with you and your family. We did. I uh, had a great pleasure of going to your home and meeting your lovely wife and some of your kids. Family's massive to you, isn't it? It I mean, is. It's probably the most important thing in your life, right? It is. My wife and my children and my siblings and my dad, my mom has passed, as you know, a long time ago. Um, they're the most important thing in my life because in the end, one of the things about getting some measure of, of notoriety is that you, know, you can let it take over your head. And one of the things that's always been great is, you know, I've been able to go home to my family and, you know, they don't treat me any differently. You know, my younger son, Patrick, one time when I was admonishing him when I was governor that he had to do his homework mm -hmm. and he wouldn't do it for his mother. And I said, look, this is my house. I set the rules. You go and do your homework now. And he said, he was 10 years old at the time. He said, fine. And then he went to storm up the stairs to his room. And he turns around and he goes, just remember something, Dad. You're not the governor of this house. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of the way the family's always been. And they're now older now. They're now 29, 27, 22, and 20. Um, and they, the biggest gift I've gotten from them is they really like each other. Mm. They hang with each other. I've, I've had the same thing with my sons. And it's I, so great, after right? After years of fighting, they got to their 20s and then they all became great friends. Yeah. I love that. And what a gift, right? Because And we, also, I, I don't know about you, but I, I read or saw a TikTok, I think, of somebody saying that the real definition of success for any man is if his children 
when they get to adult age, still want to hang out with them. Yeah. And mine do, thank God. Yep. And it's a great joy to me. And yours do. Yeah. But I do think that's an interesting yardstick of real success in life. It is. If your kids still want to be around you when they don't have to be. That's right. And they're not relying on you. That says a lot about you as a human being. It does. And I think for my wife and I, we're really proud of that. Mm. But we don't take any chances, you know, uh, Piers. We also bought a beach house at the Jersey Shore. So they'd have some place to come back to <laughs> that was very attractive. So yeah, I got a place in L.A. for the same reason. That's exactly right. <laughs> you got to do that. So that's what I call is a family insurance policy. Just in case, come back to the beach. If you just go forward a bit, you knock out Trump, you win the presidency, inauguration day. What do you say to the American people? That it's time for us once again to put our country first. It's time for us to put aside some of our differences and figure out areas where we can work together and compromise. And that the kind of president I would hope to be would be one that would be able to forge those compromises and sacrifice my own popularity to be able to make action happen. Your mother said to you before she died that far more important to be respected than to be loved. Because if you're respected, the love comes down the line. I thought it was really good advice. It was great advice. Would you take that advice into a presidency? It's, it's the advice I take into every day of my life. Mm. It's not just into my jobs. It's into the way I do with my kids, too. I want to be a, a someone who they respect mm. in addition to someone they love. Because if they respect me, then they're going to come to me when they have problems. They're going to come to me for advice. They're going to come to me when they just need to cry. And that's the kind of respect that if I were to become president, I'd want the American people to know that every day I'd be working as hard as I could to make them feel that respect for me, but more importantly, for them to feel proud of their country. And I think there are moments now where Americans don't feel proud of our country um, because of some of the things we're failing to do. And I want us to do the big things. The thing that I always wanted when I was governor, I used to say to my folks all the time, don't tell me about what's, how something will affect my ratings today. Mm. Tell me if it's something that really is consequential. I want to be a governor of consequence, and I believe I was. And that's the kind of president I want to be, to do the big things, to be a president of consequence. Governor, great to see you again. Good to see you, Pierce.